Good afternoon and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival online. Uh, my name is Matt Vidma and it is my pleasure to host this session uh, as well as introduce a colleague at the University of Edinburgh, uh, Dr. 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 Kenneth Bailey, uh, to speak on a very current and urgent topic. Dr. Bailey has a background in medicine and he completed his basic training at Glasgow before going on to study anesthesia at Edinburgh. He has led on International Severe Acute Respi Respiratory Infection Consortium and he has worked at the World Health Organization on H1N1, influenza, MERS and Ebola studies. During the COVID outbreak, he has led two UK-wide efforts. He discovered new biological mechanisms underlying critical illness in COVID and he also contributed to the discovery of effective drug treatments to reduce mortality and contributed to the design and delivery of a major trial titled Recovery. He is the team leader of the genomic study where Edinburgh University researchers have studied DNA of patients in intensive care across the UK and compare this with the samples of healthy volunteers. In particular, the, in particular, the study wanted to answer why do some people become desperately ill from COVID whilst other, uh, others are little affected? Well, I'm sure we're all very keen to find that out. So if you have any questions as Kenneth gives his talk, please enter them into the YouTube's live chat. We'll come back to this at the end of the talk. But for now, I'm really delighted to welcome Kenneth to Orkney Science Festival. And it's over to you, Kenneth. Well, thanks very much indeed. It's a privilege to give a talk at this, uh, the second oldest international science festival in the world. Um, uh, Orkney is a place that's very dear to my heart and I'm um, disappointed that I've chosen to uh, join you in the in the one year, hopefully, when uh, the festival won't be held in Orkney. I don't know if the um, excuse to visit. And of course, the population of Orkney have made a substantial contribution to my um, scientific field of interest in human genetics through the work of Professor Jim Wilson and the ORCADE study, um, which has um, uh, taught us much about how the genome works um, uh, by, by studying um, uh, that population in, in great detail. So I'm going to tell you um, about some of the work that we've been doing in uh, the COVID outbreak and um, what we have discovered. Um, the, the title Five Genes and the Virus is as of about half past midnight um, uh, this morning, slightly out of date, we actually um, have just um, discovered another 17 genes that are implicated in the, um, uh, the uh, susceptibility of, of people to the virus. Um, and um, we'll be able to share more information about that um, very soon, I hope. Um, so I'm gonna start by just going back to um, the beginning of the outbreak and um, talking about what we knew about the virus then and what we decided we needed to know. Um, it's, it's, um, it's easy to forget because COVID has been with us for so long, but when it first arrived, um, we were aware of what things had looked like in China and Italy and other places. Um, we knew that um, it was likely to cause a large number of people to become critically ill. Um, and we knew from SARS, that um, intensive care staff were particularly at risk, or at least that's what we thought um, based on, on the SARS outbreak from 2002 and 2003, when many intensive care doctors and nurses lost their lives. And I think it's, um, uh, it, it's tremendously inspiring to um, reflect on uh, the response of healthcare workers um, like these in this photograph. Um, these are ICU nurses in the intensive care unit that I work in, in the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh, um, queuing up to put on personal protective equipment and, and go into the, um, the red area where the, um, the patients with known COVID were being cared for. Um, and you know, uh, across the whole country, in fact, the whole world, um, healthcare workers um, stepped up. And at, at the time, um, uh, they thought they were putting themselves in, in considerable risk. And of course, um, uh, some of them tragically have died, although um, uh, many fewer than, than I think we had initially expected, um, uh, given the experience in SARS, uh, thankfully. So um, uh, taking that um, inspiration uh, into um, the scientific field, um, I, I think is important. Um, it, it, um, uh, science is often um, a competitive endeavor. Um, it, it works well in, in, in some regards in that way that drives people to really push themselves. Um, but um, faced with a challenge of this scale when it was necessary to make discoveries quickly and advance our understanding um, uh, by, 
by working together across the whole world, um, uh, we've been able to um, uh, make discoveries much more quickly. Um, and uh, it, it, it really is true that uh, the scientists set aside their competitive instincts and, and um, were tremendously effective at working together. And I do hope that that can continue beyond this outbreak. Um, Seeing this coming wasn't difficult. Um, this, um, this is a picture that someone put on Twitter of me giving a talk um, at, a, at a conference in Australia in 2019. Um, the slide that I'm showing um, is this one, which is taken from um, a, a document called the UK Cabinet Office Risk Register. Um, so this is the government um, reviewing the risks that face the country um, and uh, lining them up according to how likely they are and the, um, on the bottom. Uh, access from one to five, five being the most likely, and how severe the impact would be. And you can see that in number one position, um, both um, the joint likeliest and the most severe is an outbreak of respiratory viruses. Um, so we knew that this was a risk. We knew it was essentially inevitable. It's happened um, before again and again. There's nothing that would stop it from happening. And if, and if anything, um, it, it's become more likely in the last few decades with an increase in proximity between people and animals and um, large populations and um, international travel being so easy that um, uh, really any outbreak um, uh, couldn't realistically be contained um, in one region. What I didn't see coming, um, and, and I think um, uh, many of us in the field didn't, didn't know um, was going to happen, was um, uh, the public response to the outbreak, which um, reminded me um, of um, uh, this photograph, which I took in 2014 uh, in Sierra Leone, where I, I traveled to um, help to respond to the Ebola outbreak. Um, the, the poster in the background on the wall is a government information uh, poster, um, and the text reads, Ebola is real. And at the time, I thought that was a, um, a really surprising message that the government were giving to the population because Ebola was obviously real, it was killing lots of people and it was a, it was a, a nationwide catastrophe. But of course, as we now know, um, there um, uh, have been people across um, uh, the whole of the world who have denied the existence of COVID, um, the effectiveness of medical treatments for it, promoted treatments that, are, that have no evidence or reason to believe they're effective and are probably harmful. Um, and denied the effectiveness of, of vaccines. Um, and that, that has been um, uh, one of the most striking, surprising and um, uh, depressing um, components of this, of this whole experience. The problem that we um, initially were faced with, so my, my interest as an intensive care doctor uh, is how to treat the patients that, um, that um, uh, come to the intensive care unit who are critically ill with um, COVID. And fundamentally, the question that we began with was, we know that the patient's organs are being damaged, you know, the lungs are being damaged, they're becoming inflamed, they're not getting oxygen into the blood. That's um, uh, evident from the, from the first patient that, that, uh, that, that we met. Um, but the question of, is it the virus directly damaging the lungs um, or is it the, um, the body's immune response? Was an open one, um, and that you know that might surprise you um, to learn. But it, but really, at the beginning of this, we we didn't understand very much at all about the um, about the mechanisms by which the disease happens. And I think it's helpful just to start with a with a, a schematic graph of of the model that we are working from. So if you imagine this is over time that a patient becomes ill, um, what I've done here is try to describe um, the effect of biological processes, and by that I mean you know, things that are done, in this case by the virus, um, and I've divided them into bad or good. So bad up here um, might be, you know, you, we might expect that the things the virus does are generally bad. And you know, I've given one example of a protein that it makes where we, we're pretty confident that that is bad for you. Um, and just to be slightly more specific, um, uh, because we're, we're doing science, rather than just good or bad, um, we could say, um, this is our prediction for the impact of this process on your on the patient's chance of being alive or dead in six months time. So just a slightly more specific definition of those words. Well, the host immune response um, is probably good by and large. Um, that's that's um, clearing the virus away and um, uh, in most cases people recover. But as you can see in, in both the virus and the host, I've plotted um, a little bit of 
um, something good being done by the virus and a little bit of something bad being done by the host. And I think that's that's necessary to keep an open mind about both. The, the, the virus isn't trying to kill you, so there might be some processes that it's undertaking that actually don't do you harm and, and may benefit, uh, may, may increase your chance of survival, but um, we don't know what they are. And the host immune response um, could be harming you. And in fact, that, that has been the, um, for the last few decades, really, the our understanding in intensive care medicine of most of the diseases that we treat, most of the diseases caused by uh, infection that, that um, uh, cause people to become desperately sick and need to have support from um, ventilators and other organ support in the intensive care unit. Most of those diseases are, are in fact driven by the, your own immune system causing damage. Um, uh, IgM is just an example of a host process we know is good. But the, but the potential for harm from host immune processes, from your own immune system killing you, um, is um, uh, something that we considered immediately um, and that we have some treatments that maybe might help or might cause harm um, depending on, on um, how the processes are working. And I've listed a few of the ones that we were thinking of at the beginning um, on this slide. Well, the first information that we got that uh, answered some of these questions came from a trial that um, uh, Magnus mentioned in the introduction. It's called Recovery. It's led by Peter Horby and Martin Landry from Oxford. Um, I was very privileged to contribute to setting it up. Um, and it taught us the first things that we really knew about, about the mechanisms of the disease. So by finding a treatment, we understood more about the mechanisms of disease. These are the treatments that we um, have tested. So I've, I've listed um, the names of the treatments here. Um, and um, straight away, we started asking patients across the whole United Kingdom when they were presenting to hospital with COVID, um, would they participate in a clinical trial? So would they accept that we don't know how to treat this disease um, and that our best way of finding out is by randomly assigning people to either no extra treatment, usual care, or um, uh, one of these um, treatments. Um, and of course, for the individual patient, that gives them a chance at getting a, a therapy that might be effective, but also a chance of getting a therapy that might be harmful. Um, and for um, society and, and science, um, it gives us the chance to really answer a question because we've randomly assigned people to getting these treatments. We can really know with some confidence whether they work or not. And for five of them, we've shown they don't work. In fact, hydroxychloroquine, which was like ivermectin, is now very popular at the beginning of the outbreak, um, you know, put forward as a treatment by um, people like President Trump and um, many, uh, many others around the world um, of questionable scientific um, uh, uh, training. Um, hydroxychloroquine was not effective as treatment and in fact probably caused harm. It probably increased your chance of dying. Three of the treatments that we've tested have so far been found to be effective. Um, two of them and uh, all the patients who tried them, one of them only in a subset. Um, and um, that has um, really advanced our understanding of the disease because um, the, the most effective treatments, dexamethasone and tocilizumab, um, are both treatments that suppress your own immune system. They, they suppress inflammation and, and damage being caused by the immune system. So that shows that those host processes are really a big part of what's happening. The two that I've highlighted at the bottom are both the treatments that are actually still currently in the trial. We don't have answers for them yet, although we have evidence from other trials that is supportive. Um, and both of those uh, were included in the recovery trial in part because of genetic evidence. And that's what the rest of my talk will be about. Um, this is just a reminder of the, um, the big reveal of the very first um, effective treatment for COVID, dexamethasone, um, which Peter Horby, um, standing on the right in this image, um, uh, revealed at a press conference after only three months um, of, um, of the trial running, which um, is an absolutely extraordinary record and, and one that um, I think we all hope that we never have to break again. The result for dexamethasone tells us something about the patients who we see in hospital as well. Um, and so if, you, if you'll forgive me um, uh, showing a bit of detail, I'll, um, I'll just explain that a little more. So this graph shows um, uh, the average, the box here shows the average and the size of the box is bigger if there are more patients uh, in a given group. Um, so this is the average overall and the filled in squares are the box that indicates the average effect for each of three groups. People who are on a ventilator in the intensive care unit, people who are getting oxygen but aren't on a ventilator, and people who are in hospital but don't need oxygen as a treatment. 
the position of the average, the position of that that box on on this line indicates um, the best estimate from the trial results of the effect of treatment with dexamethasone. So um, if it's less than one, then that shows that dexamethasone is better. Um, so this is your, your chance of dying. Um, so your chance of dying is less than one if you're treated with dexamethasone, that's because dexamethasone is better. And if it's greater than one, then um, uh, usual care is better or rather dexamethasone is worse. Um, the line around about the box indicates how certain we are. So as you can see, um, the line for the group of patients who are not on oxygen is quite wide. So we can't be sure that it caused harm, dexamethasone caused harm in this group, but we um, can be very sure um, that it caused a benefit, that it helped people overall. The group of patients that, um, that I treat in the intensive care unit are this group here. And I think it's very striking how, that how different their response to treatment is from people who didn't need oxygen. So these are people with COVID who've been admitted to hospital because of their COVID, but, um, but don't have lung problems that are bad enough to need oxygen. Um, and in that group, dexamethasone was not effective and may have been harmful. Um, whereas in the patients that I see um, who are on ventilators, um, it was extremely um, beneficial. So that shows us that there are um, different um, mechanisms, different biological events that are happening in this disease um, in these different groups of patients, which is very important for the study that I'm now going to tell you about, um, in which we looked at the genetics of people who are only in this group highlighted in red here. Now, the reason we looked at genetics um, is because um, we know that there are a couple of things that are true across all infectious diseases that we've studied. And the first is that there is always, in every population, human or animal or livestock, every population we've really studied, there is variability in your, in your susceptibility to infection. This graph shows um, some estimates for exposure to SARS-CoV-2, you know, sort of average data across the whole population. And we could argue about exactly where these cutoffs lie. But, but um, uh, the important point is that a large proportion of people who are exposed to the coronavirus do not experience symptoms at all. They get exposed, we know they get exposed because they develop antibodies in their blood or they test positive on a, on a test, but they don't get, um, get any symptoms. And then a, a proportion of people get mild or moderate symptoms, which can be quite debilitating, but, but aren't life-threatening. And then a relatively small number of people, again, I've, I've, I've um, averaged this across age groups, um, but something like 1% of people develop critical illness and uh, need to be treated uh, in the intensive care unit. Um, and that's a, a remarkable variation ac across a population of, of organisms, humans, who are you know, all um, uh, physiologically fairly similar. The other sort of um, foundational rule is that your chance of dying from an infection is very strongly encoded in your genes. Um, and my, my favorite piece of evidence of that, and, and there are many, uh, is from this study, which actually conducted in Scandinavia um, in the 1980s. Um, and this group, Sorensen and his colleagues, looked at patients who are people who were adopted um, and had died. I'll just shrink myself a little so you can see this graph. Um, uh, they died um, of one of these three causes. So either cardiovascular disease, cancer, or an infection. So um, among people who were adopted, um, if their parents died of one of these causes, the investigators looked at the effect that had on the child's chance of subsequently dying of, those, of the same cause. So if your adoptive parents, the people who brought you up, who you're, you call mum and dad, but, but um, aren't biologically related to you, died of cardiovascular disease, that's heart attacks, strokes and the like, then you were about three times more likely to die of a heart attack or a stroke yourself. And if your biological parents died young of a heart attack or a stroke, then you're about four and a half times more likely to die of one of those causes yourself. So the biological parents, of course, you're biologically related to, they gave you your DNA, um, but, but didn't play any other role or much other role in your upbringing. So we, we, we infer that, um, that their contribution to your risk was transmitted to you through um, whatever they passed on um, to you at conception or, or at least at birth. Um, and for the um, adoptive parents, the assumption is that the way they brought you up or the habits that they taught you um, or the place where they raised you um, is, is what you share with them. And so that's, that's why they um, 
uh, contribute to your risk. For cancer, um, the numbers are the other way around. So the environmental effect, the effect of your adoptive parents is much greater. Um, but for infectious disease, if your adoptive parent, the person you called mum or dad, who probably coughed on you during their final illness, died young of an infection, then you're no more likely to die of an infection than anyone else in the population. But if your biological parent, someone you might never have met in your entire life, died young of an infection, then you're about six times more likely to die of an infectious disease yourself. So these, uh, th that spectrum of variation is at least in part explained by your um, genetics, by something that you got from your, your parents and most likely your DNA. And that makes sense if you think about it in the context of how we came to be here. So this is an image that shows your family tree going right back um, from a representative of modern humans. I've, I've chosen the template for modern humans, um, Pele, um, right back through um, uh, Homo erectus to um, various um, intermediate species um, that are um, known from the fossil record to um, fish that developed organs that were a little bit like lungs. Um, and the picture that I've put here um, of a fish um, is a coelacanth. And that's not our direct ancestor. It, it, our direct ancestor, I think, is now believed to be a lung fish. Um, but the coelacanth is um, uh, a, a fish that was studied from the fossil record. People had, um, had found fossilized coelacanths and, and knew that they fitted into the evolutionary tree in, the, in a certain place and there was a whole field of people, scientists all over the world studying them um, and they were thought to be um, long extinct um, uh, having existed 400 million years ago. Um, but that image there, unlike most of the other pictures here, is not a drawing, that's a photograph because um, in the 20th century in the Pacific Ocean a fisherman caught one um, and um, uh, shared it with the evolutionary biologists who'd been studying these fish from fossils for their for their whole careers, which must have been quite a moment. This tree shows your ancestors, but the important thing to remember is that the ancestors you're descending from, you're descended from, were the survivors of a population that was um, quite large. So we are descended from the, the survivors of every outbreak of infection in history, right back to 400 million years ago and before. Um, all of these other coelacanths that didn't make it um, were selected out and throughout every stage in your evolution, um, infectious diseases have been killing your ancestors and selecting for the survivors. It's, it's the, um, uh, the organisms that made it to reproduce um, that we're uh, descended from. And that has a profound effect on our genome, our immune system uh, and our ability to fight infections. And we know from um, you know, a combination of the fossil record and studies of, of um, archaeology and, and, um, and genetic archaeology, um, roughly when some infections became important. So we, we have an idea that, um, sorry, uh, that um, uh, malaria and tuberculosis and um, smallpox have been with us for quite a long time. Um, diseases like um, coronaviruses are probably more recent than influenza. Um, these respiratory infections transmitted between people probably required us to be in larger populations to transmit very effectively and have large animal reservoirs. Um, but the point is that our evolution has greatly shaped our genomes and has left us with this hangover that, um, that we're um, susceptible to some infections, resistant to others, and that those features are encoded in our DNA. To tackle the question of how to find which bits of DNA uh, are um, responsible for your susceptibility to a given infection, um, we have to take into account how big your genome is. Um, the genome is made up of a code made by different sugar bases, we call them, um, that are um, assigned the letters A, C, T, and G. So it's this, it's like it's just a sequence of sugars in a in a very long molecule that um, uh, boils down to a code of A's, C's, T's and G's in a sequence. And at any one position, there can only be one of those four um, bases. So um, at a single position, if you only have one letter of the code, there are four possible combinations. And if you have two positions, there are 16, four times four. If you add another letter, the number is 64, four times four times four. And as you add letters, the number of possible combinations increases very quickly Indeed. So you can start to get an idea of how much information is encoded in the human genome 
um, by um, working out how many possible combinations there might be. And I'm computing these numbers actually live um, as, as they're displayed on a um, reasonably recent Mac laptop, but at about, about 10 to the power of 300, it gives up and thinks you couldn't possibly want to know a number that high, we'll just call it infinity. That's at about 500 bases of code that my computer gave up because there are too many possible combinations for it to calculate. There are 3 billion letters in the sequence of the human genome. Um, so that means there are four to the power of three billion possible combinations. And when you start to think about it in, in those terms, uh, it becomes possible to understand how um, we might um, uh, encode so much information uh, in that um, that, uh, that makes an organism as complex as a human and an immune system as complex um, as the system that, uh, that we're um, studying. So um, to tackle this, um, we started in 2015, a study called Genomic, the Genetics of Mortality and Critical Care Study. And very simply, we got DNA from people who were desperately sick in intensive care units with infections. The study was led um, by a team in Edinburgh, um, and um, I have to draw attention to the contribution of this lady, Fiona Griffiths, who um, joined the team, actually funded by a Scottish charity called FEET, the Fiona Elizabeth Agnew Trust. Um, uh, Fiona joined the team to um, run recruitment um, and um, do all of the administration and, and um, set up um, activity to get um, not just the intensive care unit that I work in or um, uh, the intensive care units that my friends work in in a few different places around the country, but almost every single intensive care unit, 224 intensive care units across the whole UK um, contributing. And these are the results. Um, this is the, um, the thrilling finding that we got um, actually um, in September last year, um, we um, first reported this. Um, uh, this, this graph shows um, about 5 million blue spots lined up um, by every, along, according to every chromosome in the genome. So if I move myself a little bit out of the way, um, these are all the chromosomes lined up one to 22, we've left off X and Y. Um, and um, they're plotted, the blue spots are plotted um, on this axis. So they're higher up if we're more sure. Um, and the two sides of the graph are the, the top half is um, our study in the UK genomic um, the bottom half is our study in the UK combined with everything else from all the other international studies um, from scientists who generously shared their data with us. So as you can see, um, there are a number of points where um, uh, the blue spots are, are very high, indicating we've got a very high level of confidence these are real. Um, and essentially, if they're above the red line, um, then um, uh, we're confident enough that they're real. And then we check them again in, in other studies to be sure. Um, I'm not going to go through, I think it'd be, it'd be a bit much to go through every single one of these um, and talk about what they mean. Um, but really these, um, these genes, because they tell us um, which genes in the immune system actually change your chance of becoming desperately sick with COVID, they lead us directly to the components in that huge and incredibly complex system where changing something makes a difference. And of course, that's directly therapeutically relevant information. Um, we can use that to, um, to, to inform our choice about which treatments to use or to try rather in, in clinical trials. And of course, um, we need to try them in clinical trials um, in order to find out that they work. Um, I, I'm gonna just, just for um, context, um, uh, show you the results um, of an autopsy study. So um, uh, these data come from a study led by David Dorward actually here in Edinburgh, where um, he looked at patients who died of COVID um, and did very quick, um, and I'd say soon after death, did, did autopsies, of course, with the, with the full consent of their um, relatives. Um, he made a very um, striking finding, um, which is if you compare the um, parts of the body where the virus is, shown in green here, with the places where the inflammation is, the damage to organs from the immune system, they don't overlap. So um, the virus is found in all over the body in people who, are, who have died from, from COVID, um, but the inflammation, the damage to the organs is only found really in, in large part in, in two places, the lungs and uh, this organ here is the spleen, a, a major component of the immune system. Um, and, and you can see that in the um, the graph here which shows um, actually every individual patient of whom the ones I've highlighted down here are the intensive care patients. And you can see there are some examples here of patients um, like this one who, um, this, this patient who sadly died after 30 days of treatment um, had virus in green detected in lots of places in the body, but not the lung um, and inflammation 
um, in the lung. So um, that that um, that finding helps us to understand um, one of the genes or several of the genes actually that we um, have found to be um, important in COVID. So um, this gene here, um, uh, this is just zoomed in on that graph showing one variant crossing the red line indicating that um, there's a significant association. And we're fairly confident that it relates to um, this gene here, tyrosine kinase 2. Um, and there's another gene that is, which is called DPP9. And both of these are, are important genes in um, inflammation, signaling for inflammation. Um, and so um, together with the results of the autopsy study, that, that points us towards um, uh, not um, uh, the body's response to the virus directly causing damage, but actually an idiosyncratic aberrant process where inflammation is happening um, and the immune system is, is attacking a tissue where the virus isn't there at all. Um, so the, this result has, has led directly um, within um, a, a matter of months to the inclusion of a new treatment uh, in the recovery trial. We're still randomizing patients to receive that treatment. We don't yet know if it works on top of the other treatments that we're already using, um, but it does um, have some very convincing evidence from other trials now um, showing that at least on its own um, or in combination with dexamethasone, it's likely to be effective. I'm going to um, leave time for questions, so I'll stop there, but I must acknowledge um, uh, some of the people who contributed to the work that I've shown, um, whose names are on this slide, um, and most importantly of all, the uh, patients and their relatives who contributed to this work by um, offering to join the study um, for no benefit to themselves to, to help others at a time in their lives when um, uh, they must have been absolutely terrified. Um, and of course, to the huge um, army of research nurses and investigators across the whole country um, who uh, actually recruited patients into the study. I'll stop there and uh, I'll be delighted to take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kenneth. That was absolutely fascinating. And there was loads of questions coming through. Um, and we'll try and, and get to as many of them as, as, as possible. I think uh, perhaps the most pertinent, if not a little bit impertinent question is, right? So we, we might not exactly know what our genes are like, whether, you know, how susceptible we might be or not. But is there anything that we can do to sort of strengthen, uh, you know, our body's response that is sort of in the right way, doesn't, doesn't exasperate the, the inflammation um, whilst on the other hand still fighting off the virus? Is it anything? Well, I, I think um, uh, this being a public forum, um, I'm going to give you a, a very boring and obvious answer. Um, the thing, the one thing that you can do uh, to avoid um, uh, becoming sick with the virus is to get vaccinated. Vaccines are effective and um, they are um, overwhelmingly safe, um, certainly um, uh, massively safer than um, taking the risk of getting COVID. The second thing you can do, of course, is to protect yourself and others by um, uh, observing social distancing um, recommendations. The, the genome, of course, you can't change your genome, um, uh, or at least, uh, I mean, there is, there is technology that uh, enables you to edit genomes, but it's really not a good idea. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the genome can, I think now that we have uh, even more than the five um, variants that I, that I showed you in that graph, um, we have more discoveries that we're really just beginning to understand um, from, from literally, you know, uh, this week. Um, the, um, uh, there probably is enough information to make a prediction based on a person's genetic sequence um, about um, some part of their risk of getting COVID, but it really won't make a big difference to your, it won't, it won't make a big difference to your risk compared to things like age and um, uh, other illnesses that you have. Um, so, you, so for example, the chance of um, getting sick, I mean, getting critically or desperately sick with COVID um, uh, changes 11 fold um, between the ages of 50 and 80. Um, and the strongest single effect for any gene that we found um, changes your chance of, of becoming sick with COVID by about two and a half uh, fold. So um, uh, the genetic effects are smaller. And really, I think um, because most of us don't know our genome sequence, the utility, the reason for doing this is to, is to find treatments, find components of the, um, of the immune system where we might be able to intervene with a treatment. Yeah, indeed. So I think this is a kind of a, 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 a relative, relatively sort of set, sort of similar point, which is, of course, a lot of us are, have been wondering since, um, you know, all this started, whether we were 
within that sort of 40 to 60 percent lucky category whereas you know of course you, you could have a completely asymptomatic infection um and um and, and you just don't know and, and effectively in a sense you know uh, understanding that going forward you know many people will, will be quite attracted to this understanding whether they were or weren't exposed to the virus uh, but of course that is now kind of complicated because with the vaccination of course we now develop antibodies not entirely clear i mean is there a way to use understanding of inflammation response of the body even if it is asymptomatic because you know it, it won't be a, a full-scale inflammation but they will still leave perhaps some traces in the body to understand if somebody has been infected with COVID prior to vaccination because after that of course the picture is a bit more difficult. Uh, so, th so that question is a little out of my field but but the answer is yes because if, if you really wanted to in a research setting um, there are there are more antibodies uh, or different antibodies that um, can be detected. What you the, the trouble is that you can't know the negative. Um, you can you can sometimes tell if you've got an antibody, you know that that um, a particular um, type of vaccine antibody that, that would be yeah. raised by the virus, but not by the vaccine. Then you 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 know. But if you don't find it, you don't know that it wasn't there. That's that's the problem with all of these um, tests. Yes, I think people are also very interested because of your work in the in the treatment, right? I mean, there's been some clear indication as to what works and what doesn't work. I think some one of our very um, eagle-eyed um, um, audience has spotted that you've not really commented on aspirin that much, but it was listed amongst amongst the, that list, I believe. So, um, how did the aspirin fare? You know, there's a, I suspect this is a kind of a, also the thing that you know people are, are are interested because that is something that is very widely available. So, of course, that's something that. So it hasn't been shown to be effective. Um, so um, I think my slide might have been slightly out of date, and I do, I'm afraid, sometimes forget which of the bits of information are in the public domain <laughs> from our results. But it, but but I, I can say that aspirin hasn't been shown to be effective. So the three treatments that are effective, and none of them are for use outside of hospital. So I showed you that, the effect yeah. of dexamethasone. Um, that's only intensive you, you, care unit right <laughs> well so no it's it's in patients who are in hospital and need oxygen right um so that's that's the, the majority of patients who need to be in, in hospital are there because they've got a problem with their lungs and and they need oxygen but if you were to take that and didn't have lung problems our evidence is it probably but it wouldn't help you and it might harm you so um, so uh, these treatments that we have that we really know to be effective in these contexts under medical guidance are um, uh, extremely effective um, in the right context, um, but not to be used um, uh, outside of hospitals. Um, together, once you're in intensive care um, with COVID, the effect of dexamethasone and tocilizumab, the other, the other drug that I mentioned, um, reduces your chance of dying by almost half, which is you know, frankly extraordinary considering we only met this disease for the first time um, uh, in January. 2020. Um, the third drug which has been shown to be effective, um, I didn't really talk about it, it's, got, it's a Regeneron um, antibody cocktail, so it's antibodies against the virus, and it's only effective in people, in patients who don't already have antibodies. So we did a test um, for antibody levels in those patients in hospital, and um, uh, if they didn't have antibodies to the virus, then giving them um, uh, pharmaceutically created antibodies um, improved their chance of surviving. But if they did already have antibodies, it, it wasn't effective. So that's a, that's a second, that's a subset. Um, but, it, but in that group, it is a third effective treatment. Right. So we also have some questions about, of course, the um, various variants of the virus that are emerging. And some, I think there's a, there's a slightly humorous question here, which, you know, under the context, perhaps not as humorous as you think, is the number of variants limitless or restricted to the Greek alphabet, right? So we're, what, you know, we probably haven't, scope out exactly how the virus might evolve though uh, you know as long as we are able to at least um you know severely weaken or even break that link between uh, severe illnesses and and the virus i think that that you know that maybe will we'll, i think the greek alphabet hopefully will be sufficient uh, but i think that, i think there's a there's an important question there i mean I, I suspect that you know as viruses evolve you know they're they're they will target the body systems in a slightly different way potentially and will potentially the inflammation response of the body change with new variant, variants that will just behave slightly differently? So that, that's a really fascinating question. Um, the, I think we can guarantee that the virus will evolve. Um, it it um, is both um, uh, changing all the time, you know, where it exists and it exists in so many places um, that it um, inevitably is just going to continue to evolve. Um, it's also important to 
uh, realise that when we, when we talk about um, the virus evolving, um, that's a you know that's a passive process. That's just something that happens. It's not trying to um, uh, damage the but body or uh, it's undergoing its own natural it's selection, is. right? You know, things that things exactly. that kill you too well that you're not able to infect the others is not able to spread as much as the ones that are perhaps slightly milder, right? Yes. Well, well, I think that um, uh, the um, if it you know you know Ebola in in some places in some contexts had a you know mortality rate of, of sort of seventy percent, and at that level, um, the virus is um, is probably impairing its own spread by um, uh, you know by by taking people out of the population. Although actually, um, Ebola is not a great example because the funeral processes were a major spreading mechanism. Um, uh, coronavirus um, right now, you know, isn't. Um, uh, I, I think is probably not affecting its own selection pressure by causing mortality in humans. Um, but it's not targeting viral uh, organ systems. That that it's not targeting um, our bodies at all. It's trying to. I mean, it's it's selecting for um, ongoing survival of the virus. So um, you would predict that that means transmission and the ability to copy itself. And the ability to evade the immune system and none of those things require it to cause damage to your lungs that's just really bad luck that that happens plenty of viruses copy themselves fine and don't cause you any symptoms or cause very mild um, symptoms um, it's it's just very unfortunate that this um, immune response happens that causes uh, damage to the lungs and i think it's because evolution is a random process and um, there's no reason to expect that causing lung damage would be something that is selected for it's reasonable to hope that, as with other viruses in the past, as it evolves, um, it might become uh, less likely to damage the lungs. Um, the trouble is that um, there are also the conditions in place um, with large unvaccinated populations, um, with the virus spreading um, unhindered, um, and with partially vaccinated populations um, with, with potentially inadequate immunity. Um, the conditions are there for the virus to also spread, to evade. Um, existing immunity and if it does that whilst it retains the ability to cause severe disease then you know we can see further waves. Indeed so um, I know we're shortly running out of time so I'll just uh, there's a couple of questions that I think assume a slightly higher sophistication of genetic engineering than um, we would we would normally consider such as can we actually introduce bits of good DNA one way or another into the body so that it kind of overrides you know the the immune response um, I don't know. Maybe you want to comment on that. I do. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I do, but but not in the way that you think. So, um, there's not good DNA. There's just DNA. We're the same as the virus. We just are, right? So, um, and and we know that from a few really neat examples. Um, and this is probably the case for most of the variants that we're talking about, where if you have a genetic variant that makes you resistant to one virus, it probably makes you susceptible to something else. So it's not that the people who have um, genetic features that make them susceptible to COVID are weaker than the rest of the population. They might be better at fighting something else, you know, another virus or tuberculosis or something. Um, but um, uh, they just are that way. And very unfortunately, um, uh, for this particular virus, um, it causes them to be susceptible. So it would firstly be a bad idea because the technology doesn't exist to do it very precisely. And, and if you're changing your own genome, you, you want to be really, really precise. Um, uh, but also because we don't know what we might be making you susceptible to. And it might be that next year's infection um, is, is the one that, um, that the COVID susceptible are innately resistant to. Yeah. Speaking about your own gene, I think this is a actually very good, good point. One of the uh, listeners raised that, that, you know, would we be able to, to basically do a quick geno genetic profiling of patients admitted to hospital to direct treatment? So knowing, you know, knowing what you now know, you know, would it actually make sense to 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 try and see if if, if that can you know if if, if this particular gene you know, genes are present, um, you know, then the course of treatment is adapted to that reality. Uh, so not now, and um, for two reasons. The first is we can't get that information quickly. It's it's not um, uh, possible to sequence someone's genome quite fast enough. And and secondly. Um, there's not actually a change that we would make to your treatment based on your DNA. Um, now that that might well come. Um, you know, th there are going to be genetic variants that change your response to particular treatments in particular contexts, um, but we don't know what they are for any disease, any infectious disease yet, um, and certainly not for COVID. 
Um, you know, I think maybe 10 or 15 years from now, we might all be walking around with a credit card in our pocket that has our whole genome sequence on it. And, you know, we, we might be able to make some use of that information. Um, but of course, in the context of this outbreak, um, we have all been just trying to do uh, research that makes an impact right now. Um, and for, for COVID, that means finding cheap, effective treatments that are available across the whole world. And I, I think on behalf of everybody who's listening and contributing to the Open Science Festival, we'd I think like to thank yourself as well as all your colleagues, um, you know, at, at various research institutions across across the country, across the world, as well as of course within the NHS, who not only um, managed to find so many um, crucial details about the, the treatments and the, and of course the vaccine, of course the development of the vaccines, such a successful uh, successful deployment of of research capacity that you know, we haven't really seen at that scale in in such record fast time but also managed to keep so many people alive and, and, and as well as, as, as possible. So um, I think that's a, there's, a, there's a double thank you here. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and telling us all about your research, as well as, of course, all the work that you have actually been doing, uh, not just in the context of this outbreak, but across the years. Um, and with that, um, I'm afraid our time has run out um, and we need to uh, close this session. Uh, so all I'll say is... Um, um, I would be delighted if many of our audience were to join us again at five o'clock uh, for the next talk at the Orkney Science International Science Festival, uh, which will be on a quite a different topic, uh, but also about survival in a sense, uh, because it's about resurgence of language, uh, how modern technology is helping the survival of some of the older languages. So that's at, at five o'clock, and all the links, of course, are on the Science Festival website. Uh, if you're enjoying the festival, uh, please consider donating. Uh, full details on how to do so are below. And of course, don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and follow this YouTube channel. It's very easy. Uh, again, you can just click on that little button uh, down there. Um, and remember, uh, the Festival Club, um, our informal gathering uh, every evening, when we uh, mingle and discuss some of the uh, pertinent topics of every single day, uh, will be open again this evening. Uh, we start at half past nine. Uh, also, the link is at the Open International Science um, Festival website. Uh, so again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kenneth Bailey. Uh, thank you to our great audience, to our tech team who behind the scenes have managed to keep uh, this session running uh, as smoothly as, as we could. Um, but to all of you, dear audience, thank you so much for your attention um, and goodbye for now. <laughs>